Thank you, dear Elder. I certainly appreciate the good, humble prayer. I certainly appreciate the asking of the Lord to be with me and to deliver me this morning. We certainly stand in need. As I said, standing on the floor last Sunday morning at the end of service, that truly indeed we are a very needy people. We have many, many needs. We have need, needs from the time that we're conceived until we draw our last breath. We have needs here in this life. We have needs that only the Lord can supply. Only the Lord can help us with. This morning, if I'm able to preach to you some things that's on my heart and mind, I would preach to you this morning on the subject matter of renewed strength. Renewed strength. I believe we could all relate to that. You know, I'm very thankful that we have so many numbers called out. Songs, you know, keep them popping. They're, you know, the, num- the numbers are called out. Different. Many have a song on their heart. You know, the Apostle Paul addressed that. He said, how is it when you come together in the church that you each have a song, you know? And uh, so that's scriptural, and that's good. There's two songs that's upon my heart and mind this morning. The first one would be 346. That says, show pity, Lord. I'm just going to read the first stanza and the last stanza. You know this. Show pity, Lord. Show pity, Lord. O Lord, forgive. Let a repenting rebel live. Are not thy mercies large and free? May not a sinner trust in thee. O depth of mercy can it be that mercy's still reserved for me. Ah, can my God his wrath forbear and me the chief of sinners spare. I remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he said that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Then the second song is is just across the page there, 348. Thus far the Lord has led me on. And it says, thus far the Lord has led me on. Thus far his power prolongs my days. His keeping power, his preserving power, his overruling power is the only reason that you're sitting here on this seat this morning. It's at the very root of it. Now, there's, there's other reasons, and your obedience comes into play there, but I want to tell you, without his prolonging power at the very root of it, yeah. the very power source, it wouldn't matter about your obedience. Hope you understand that. And every evening shall make known some fresh memorials of his grace. Thus when the night of death shall come, my flesh shall rest beneath the ground and wait his voice to rend my tomb with sweet salvation in the sound. So we rely upon God's grace and mercy and we rely upon his preserving, sustaining grace. This morning I want to turn, I open my Bible, and I hope we are able to open the Scripture to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. 
The main thought is going to be there in verse 5. But I would like this morning to read these 22 verses. And it will probably be easier for you that if you brought a Bible, for you to take that Bible and turn to Psalm 103. And if you didn't bring one, to take one from the end of the seat and look along with me as I endeavor to read these 22 verses without stopping. Now, after many years at Mount Olive, the people were very skeptical when I said that because they knew from experience that it was hard for me. And sometimes before I would know it, I would be interjected something. But I'm going to try to read these 22 verses. And, I, and, and I'd like for you to look at them, if you would. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For the heaven is high, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep His covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And if I read that correctly, that's all 22 verses of Psalm 103. And I, I think I made it through without stopping to come in. There's a lot of places I'd like to have stopped. Yeah. Now, brothers and sisters, I read all that. And, of course, one of those verses we did use last Sunday in trying to preach on the throne of grace. 
And of course, that was verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. The Lord hath prepared his throne. And we connected that with Isaiah chapter 66, those first few verses. But this morning, you know, there's just several places. I'll tell you what, you, you know, you could get a dozen one-hour sermons. There's a dozen one-hour sermons out of this psalm right here. If the Lord would bless you to get it out and preach it out. But we don't have that time this morning. Lord willing, there will be other times. But I want to emphasize unto you this morning, and that's why I read all those verses, because it's so rich. It's so rich. Oh, how my heart does rejoice in these expressions. And I could pick out a few of these, and I know that some of these jumped out at you as you went through this psalm. In the 12th verse, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Oh, to think upon that. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And I'm glad of 14 that the Lord knows our frame. <laughs> He remembered with that we are dust. God knows what we are. God knows our frailties. God knows our needs. God knows our weakness. God knows that we are weak according to a natural standpoint. That we need that spiritual uplifting and enlightening and exalting up. We have to have that from the Lord. Verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Has the Lord not redeemed our life from destruction? Has the Lord not redeemed us from an everlasting destruction in the hereafter? Certainly he has. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? He crowns us with it. With those tender mercies and that loving kindness. And the psalmist here, he begins with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And he ends with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Begins with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. What is within us, that new creation, it is that new creation that praises and blesses the Lord. It's not our old man. It's not our downcast man. It's not our man after Adam. It's not that Adamic man. It's not that old man, but it's the new man created in Christ Jesus, a new creation. This is from that spiritual nature that the psalmist was thinking upon these spiritual thoughts and God blessing him with these spiritual words to pen such language that captures the very essence that we can relate to, that we can understand. And I believe that's why the Apostle Paul would proclaim that this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners whom I am chief. The apostle knew what he was by nature. But verse 5 now. Who satisfied thy mouth with good things. Oh, think about, brothers and sisters, the good things that the Lord has satisfied us with. Think of all of the spiritual blessings that he has blessed us with in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Amen. Think about uh, that foreknown. <laughs> Is that not, uh, amen, a good thing? And what, shall, as the Roman letter says, and what shall we say to these things? Certainly it is a good thing that God foreloved us even before we had a being in the very mind and purpose of God. And that God for known, for new, for loved, affectionately, uh, passionately, uh, loved uh, a people uh, out of the human family. 
and chose and treasured them in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a good thing. And did something for them, the objects of his love, to predestinate them to be conformed to the image of his Son in the glorious day of the resurrection. To predestinate them unto the adoption of children to take them out of Adam's family and put them in his family by birth. Amen. Uh, and by adoption. Thank God for that new birth from above. As Jesus explained that to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3 that ye must be born again. He didn't tell Nicodemus anything there to do to get it. He just told him that it had to be done. Yeah. Amen. Notice that. Very plain and very simple. So that has to take place somewhere here in time as each one of God's elect comes along in time. Oh, that that does take place sometime between conception and death. Uh, it can't take place before conception and it won't be after death. It has to take place before death in order for the soul and spirit at the time of death to soar away and to be in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He has satisfied us with all of these good things, blessed us with these great blessings. And then in a temporal sense, he satisfies us with great gifts of his goodness and his mercy. And even his very goodness leads us to repentance. The goodness of the Lord will lead us in the way of repentance, in the way of a changing of a mindset to, to make improvements and, a, and a, to walk in a, a better walk, in a better way of discipleship, in a more way, honorable way of pleasing our blessed Lord and Savior. Our Lord knows that we need His mercy. The Lord knows that's what he's telling us in this psalm. God knows we're but grass. God knows that we're human beings. God knows we have this sin nature. And therefore, though to his people, he extends grace and mercy. Yeah. And he continuously extends that grace and mercy as we live and travel here upon the shores of time. No matter how despondent, no matter how down, uh, no matter how downcast that we are, no matter how weak uh, that we get, uh, no matter what it seems to be our plight, uh, amen, the, the, the mercy of God endureth forever. The grace of God uh, is there uh, for his people. At this point in time, I want to mention two characters in the Bible. If you would turn backwards to Job. Job chapter 3. I want you to listen to these words. Job has gotten now in a terrible state of being. Job is sitting upon a, a heat pile. He has sore balls from the crown of his head, the sole of his feet. He's, he's scraping it with broken pieces of pottery. Uh, his family, all of his substance, everything in this life, he is in the, the dire midst of such sore tribulation, such sore trial. To Job utters these words in chapter 3. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born. I want to tell you, if you've ever lived four, five, six, seven decades, you've come up through the, the heat of the battles and the heats of the toils and tribulations of this life, there has come, uh, in the, I would dare say, the vast majority of people's lives that you have gone through such hard things and such despair and such despondency that the thought has come through your mind, I wish I had never been born. Just being honest today. Sure. Brother Job, what did the Bible say of him? The Bible says there in chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Oz, of, of Uz, I said Oz, 
in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Notice that. That's what the Bible said of this man. Said that he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. There's four things right there that's a good testimony to his character. Sure it is. But after all these things now has taken place, Job says, let the day perish wherein I was born. And the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Let that night perish, that night I, that it was said that a man child is conceived. Let that day, cursed be that day. Let that, let that day perish wherein I was born. Job was in a very low state. Job's strength was weak at that point. And, 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 I'm, and I'm sure not criticizing him. No. A thousand times no. I'm just stating the fact of the way that it was. I'd been, I'd been in the same shape and worse. Amen. I'd have been in the same shape and worse. But now... We don't have time to go through the book and to get to the end, but you know in the end, he got lifted up, didn't he? (laughs) In the end, he got strength. In the end, he... Oh, remember uh, what we uh, went through there in Psalm 84? After Job had gone through that Bacchus veil, that, that land of... Veil of no supply and of dryness. But those that go through that, the only way to go through it and to get up to Jerusalem is at verse 7 of Psalm 84. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appear before God. How, How do you get to that point? How do you get that place to where once again... You can uh, feel, you can uh, uh, realize the presence of the Lord when you've been down so low. It's because you've had to go from strength to strength. Oh, we have to go from blessing to blessing. We have to go from renewal to renewal. And sometimes it's a long dry spell. Sometimes it's through the very heat of the battle. Then I want to... Turn forward and I want to go over to Jeremiah in the 20th chapter. There in Jeremiah, chapter 20. When you start reading this chapter, you're going to find that there's a priest there that has taken, and the Bible says that this, that this priest, that he was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord. And he heard that Jeremiah had prophesied some things. Jeremiah had prophesied some things that this priest that that is the chief governor in the house of the Lord didn't like. And when he took Jeremiah and he put him in stocks, Jeremiah is at a low point. Jeremiah has went through some tough things. Jeremiah is ready to give up the ministry. Yeah. Jeremiah is ready to quit prophesying. He's ready to quit preaching. It's enough, Lord. It's too much. I've had enough. He's ready to tap out. He's ready to cry uncle. He's even, he says in verse 9, Then said I, I will... I will not make mention of him. Talking about the Lord. I'll not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. I'll quit preaching. I'll quit prophesying. I'll quit saying anything to these folks. These folks don't appreciate it anyway. Uh, uh, even the, the priest, the governor, the chief governor in the house of the Lord put me in stocks. They don't care. Let God just do to them and be with them and ever how he will. But, (laughs) but, thank God for, but, (laughs) thank God in your life when you've been at the very uh, despair. And remember where I read to you there in Psalm 103, the Lord, He remembered that we are what? That we're just 
dust. Yeah. We're just dust. And then in another place, I believe back over in Genesis and dealing there in one place with Abraham, it said the, the, the says that we are but dust. Yeah. All right, so so here, but his word was in mine heart. <laughs> As a burning fire shut up in my bones. Yeah. He didn't say his word was in my mouth. I think his word, the Lord's word had done got out of his mouth. And it was just because it was in his heart. Yeah. It was because of what he was in his heart. It's because of the call of God in his heart. Because you remember in the first of Jeremiah how that the Lord had ordained him and sanctified him and called him from his mother's womb and ordained him to be a prophet. God's hand was upon him. But through his ministry and through his his life there and coming to that point, he had had enough. He was but human after all, was he not? Sure he was. He was He was a... A descendant of Adam. He had all the frailties, all the weaknesses, all the contradictions, all of the problems, all of all of that. And so you are, and I am, and we all are. We're all just Adam multiplied. Right. What is six 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 the number of man, but man multiplied. Yeah. Man multiplied. That's exactly what we are. Where depravity multiplied. Oh, and without the uh, constraining uh, grace of God, without the intervening of God, if God removed uh, his hand, if God removed the constraints, uh, and uh, uh, we could uh, act out to a degree uh, in our own lives, in our own experiences, we could act out to such a degree to perish and to despair. Even as we live here in this life, I tell you, old brother Jeremiah, he was, he was at a low point. He was symbolically in the belly of the whale, <laughs> just like Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of hell. Oh, in that fish's belly, Jonah was there. He, he'd gone down into the depth of the deep, to the, to, down to the bottom of the mountains. He was at the low of lows. Yeah. But when he came to himself, when he was renewed, when Jonah's strength was renewed, yeah. what did he say? He professed salvation is of the Lord. Amen. And that's just what... Job, no doubt, come to realize deliverance is of the Lord. This is what Jeremiah came to realize. Deliverance is of the Lord. But even as he said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. In other words, I was compelled this, this burning within me And I couldn't quit prophesying. I couldn't quit the ministry. God's grace was sufficient. God's renewed his strength. This is, it it goes on over a few verses to help us to even understand the clarity of his state when he was saying these words in verse 9. To me, verse 9 and verse 14 and 15 go together. He said, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. Jeremiah was in the same state of mind as Job was. He was in the same state of mind. He was in despair. He was at the bottom. Just like Jonah was at the bottom. And their strength had to be renewed. And this is what, here in Psalm 103, who satisfied thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm not going to go, but for the sake of time, into a whole lot about the process that goes on with an eagle. 
but it's very interesting. And I, I asked you to do a little research upon it and, and look that up and, and read about it. Uh, there's a, a metamorphosis uh, that an older, it's, and not to the end of his life, but somewhere in the middle of his life, that, uh, and, and, and it can happen more than one time, that a process that an eagle goes through. An eagle is a majestic animal. But there, it comes period of uh, a bird, but there's period of times uh, when it grows old and its features grow old, its beak uh, changes. Uh, it has to uh, go through to lose its feathers to get the new feathers. Uh, it has to pull out its tendons in order to grow new tendons uh, and, and so forth and on uh, so that its strength is renewed so that it gets back to that youthfulness wherein it can keep going and wherein it can survive. Where it can keep getting its prey. It's very interesting if you would like to do that to look up those things. And the scripture uses about an eagle in, in a lot of places. But one of the greatest uh, things that's used about uh, uh, the eagle in the scripture, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles, there comes points in time where the eagle goes through this metamorphosis, through this changing, uh, through getting rid of, uh, of that that has happened to him through through a long period of time through age and so that he gets back uh, a form of vitality and youthfulness to continue to be able to be what he has been. Yeah. You know, that's what the Lord does for us. That's right. And so we have to come through those hard knocks. We have to go through those trials. The trying of your faith worketh patience. And so we understand that. And we fail this time and we have to go back. We have to read the lesson again. We fail. We have to go back and take the course over. Oh Lord, I've, I've took the course a lot of times. Amen. Because the failures fell in the course. And if you'll be honest with yourself, you've failed the course yeah. before. You had to go back and go through the course again and take the test again. <laughs> but God was merciful. Amen. Your strength was renewed. We, as, we are impatient and we as human beings, we... You know, Peter asked the Lord, if my brother offend me, how, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times in a day? What did the Lord tell Peter about that? But I tell you, seven times seven. That'd be 490 times. You know, I think it would be nearly impossible for somebody to offend you 490 times in a day. But uh, somebody say, oh no, I know somebody that can do it. Well, uh, I'll leave that with you. But, uh, but I think it's near, I think it's might near impossible. But... So what's the Lord showing? The Lord is showing whatever it is yeah. by saying that. Right. It's a teaching number. Right. Wouldn't to be a, as far as a literal 490. But it's all encompassing, in other words. Right. Whatever it takes, forgive. Well, I've forgiven and I've forgiven and I've forgiven. Well, I'm glad... To know that God has forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. Amen. And He keeps on forgiving. He keeps on helping us. He keeps on renewing our strength. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The good and perfect gifts that God gives. The upliftings and the strength. It renews us. Back to strength and vitality and back to a better time. Yeah. Oh, back to a refreshing time that we had, and that new time that we had in our experience with the Lord. You know, that, that goes along so well there with Isaiah chapter 40. Very familiar verses of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 28. Hast thou not known? Here's the question. Hast thou not known? 
Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? God's mercy does not faint. God's loving kindness does not faint. God's tenderness in dealing with his people does not faint. Now, he did also bring out and mention, though, because there are occasions and there are instances that we could turn to in the Scriptures. He did say in verse 9, He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. You don't, you don't want to tempt the Lord. You don't want to try the Lord. In other words, you don't want to, to try Him because there are individuals and there are and there was with the children of Israel it came the time that God basically said to them, you cross this line and whenever they kept murmuring and complaining and they wouldn't and they wouldn't listen to the good report of Joshua and Caleb. And they were even going to kill Moses. And the presence of the Lord came down at the tabernacle. And God told Moses, said, you tell them they're not going in the promised land now. And many of them's not going to ever go in because of their doings and their disobedience. Now that, it affected them here in this life. All right, it affected them. There were many of elect Israelites that died in the wilderness because of that disobedience back over there. Moses was an elect child of God, but because of disobedience, he could only see the promised land from a distance, viewing from the top of the mountain, but was not suffered to enter in. But heaven and immortal glory is his home. But he was cut off here in this life. So we do have to keep that in, in memory. And, and, and so with those Israelites, God told them, said, you're going to the wilderness and you're going to wander there for 40 years and all that's uh, above 20, year, 20 and over are going to die and perish in the wilderness. They, you remember, they kept bringing up to God about their children dying out here. Their children dying. Their children suffering this. Their children suffering that. Well, God took care of their children. Amen. God took care of the children, but them adults died in the wilderness. Yeah. And it was those children and their children that eventually came into the land of Canaan. God is faithful. Yeah. God is faithful. So God fainteth not, neither is weary. God is so long suffering, so gentle, so patient. There is no searching of his understanding. We can't comprehend the goodness of the Lord. We can't comprehend the mercy of the Lord. Thank God this morning. Oh, that he renews us. And that we can go from strength to strength. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. That's verse 29 of chapter 40. He giveth power to the faint. The Lord gave power... To Job. To, to get through. Remember the scripture in the New Testament. That he would not suffer us to be tempted or tested and tried. Above that that we're able to bear. But will with the temptation, the trying, the testing. Make a way for our escape. God made a way for Job. God made a way for Jeremiah. God made a way for Jonah. All of these we could talk about. God made a way for their escape. God will make a way for our escape. We've just got to look for it. I mean, we've got to and, and recognize it. That's our problem. We don't recognize the escape that the Lord sets there for us. We don't recognize that. Lord, help us to slow down. Lord, help us to be patient. So now he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. 
when our might is subsided, when our might is not there, oh, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. Even uh, young folks, even uh, men at, at physical peakness, uh, at, the, at the very pinnacle, at the very top of, of physical uh, 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 athleteism, uh, uh, at the very top of, of physical endurance and so forth, but yet there is a limit yeah. to what someone can endure, to what someone can do. Even there are boundaries there. Yeah. Even to someone that is at the very height. And the young men shall utterly fall. But, here we are, but yeah. in contrast, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So we have to wait upon the Lord. What did the Lord tell His disciples before He went away? He said, go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Go and tarry. Go and wait until... Yeah. They were there seven to ten days, whichever way that it, that it figured out from the calculation, depending upon from where you start and where you end, taking in consideration uh, of uh, the different feasts there and the 50th day of Pentecost. Uh, but, and of course the Lord was alive and shoot himself for 40 days. If you count the three days he was in the tomb, then they were in there seven days. If you don't... Uh, uh, if you don't count that the, the time of his death and back there to the point of unleavened bread, then they were there ten days. But from seven to ten days, they waited in that upper room. Yeah. They were patient. Go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Here we are back to the eagle. Here we are back to this example. Back to, uh, back to this symbolic uh, picture that the Lord uh, so vividly, this metaphor uh, that he shows and uses of the eagle. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Uh, run this race, as the Hebrew letter says. Run this race with patience. That is set before us. Ever looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let us run with patience this race. Uh, this is what he's saying here. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Why? Because strength is renewed. We all need renewing. We all need that renewing from time to time. There's not a one of you sitting out here this morning that from time to time, as you go through the heat of life, that you do not need renewed in the strength and in the, uh, that as though a gentle rain coming down from heaven to see uh, this is as his gospel would distill as to do. This is what the gospel will do for you. This is what sitting under the sound of the gospel, it'll be unto you as a refreshing rain. It'll be unto you uh, as a, a salmon of the dust in your life. Amen of refreshing that's why you see the Lord knew exactly what he was doing when he so ordained the preaching of the gospel and for the coming together of the church uh, and for the church to meet together uh, and to sing and praise him and to pray uh, and to hear the preaching of the gospel. There is an uplifting, there is an encouraging, there is a strengthening in hearing the scriptures and, and hearing the sense of it uh, and feeling the presence of it. Uh, and being in that environment and with brothers and sisters of like precious faith, God knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. God knew exactly what he was doing. Amen. You know, there was an old, old sister at Mount Olive, Sister Rachel Childers. And she would come in in her latter life and when she'd come in the door and come down through greeting everyone. Even in a her walker. Reminded me of Jacob leaning upon his staff. And uh, when he came to that point there in his life and, and even looking out the window and seeing the wagons and, says, and seeing the evidence that coming up from Egypt, the evidence that 
Joseph was alive and said, it is enough. <laughs> amen. I tell you, when you get to the house of the Lord, amen, the evidence of his presence and hearing the singing and the praying and sitting under the sound of the gospel, it is enough. <laughs> amen. To cheer you and to revive you and strengthen you. But many times when she came in and would come down through there, she said, one more time. Yeah. One more time. In other words, one more time she got to come to church. One more time she got to come. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Lord knew exactly what he was doing when he so designed the New Testament church, when he so built, amen, the church, amen, when he so ordered the church and when he so furnished the gospel church here below yeah. as a home away from home for his children. Amen. To hear these wonderful things and to be encouraged and to be strengthened in the very things of the Lord. I want to, want to turn over and catch a New Testament scripture over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 13. I invite you later to read these verses above and... Uh, and, and see the context, and, and I'm the Lord willing, and the Lord will help me to do so. And rightly dividing, I'm going to endeavor to, uh, to present these verses that we're going to talk about in the context that has been set forth. The apostle says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. <laughs> All right, notice that, verse 14. Knowing that he which, hath, he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Here he's going back to the resurrection. He has talked about those verses up before that he's talked about well, in verse 10, he says, Always bearing about in, in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Paul was in per perils of losing his own life a many a time. But Paul believed. He, he relied upon the Scripture and he said, We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with him. You know, Paul had hope. Yeah. Paul had great hope. It wasn't a wish. It was a hope. It was an earnest expectation. Yeah. And I want to tell you, when the Scripture says that we are saved by hope. Yep. It's not talking about we're saved by wishing. It says we are saved by and this ain't for heaven anymore to glory brothers and sisters. It's, it's right here and now. Yeah. And it has to do with this thing of being down and out and going through the troubles and the trials as we've been talking about but being raised up and renewed in the strength of the Lord. You see, you can get just about through anything when you look to the hope when you look to the earnest expectation. Right. You know, it's a whole lot easier to suffer with sickness and disease if you have an earnest expectation that you're going to overcome it. Yeah. Right? It's, it's a lot easier to forbear with and tolerate a bad circumstance or situation if you've got hope and an expectation that it can be better. All right. So as the Apostle Paul lived along in his life, he had this expectation, amen, of the delivering of the Lord, the Lord that had delivered him, the Lord that was delivering him, and the Lord that would yet deliver him and preserve him and overrule uh, all of the forces that would try to expire him here in this life that they wouldn't be able to do it until the Lord would suffer it to be done. And the Lord would call him home. So that was a great consolation yeah. in the apostles' trials and troubles. And uh, it, was even, it was even so when, when, when he was, uh, he believed so strongly that God raised up, up Christ. 
and uh, raised him from the dead. Back over in the resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, the apostle said, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Paul is saying, if, if God didn't raise him up, and if there's no expectation that God will raise us up, all that we're doing is in vain. Yeah. Your faith is in vain. He, he even says that again in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. That's even worse. Ye are yet in your sins, ain't it? Yeah. Amen. You are yet in your sins. In other words, you're still... Uh, eternally lost, you're still uh, headed to that uh, woe and misery, you're still uh, headed for that wrath to come. But Paul believed and understood and by the divine inspiration of God and by the witness of the Spirit in him believed that he had been delivered through the finished work of Jesus Christ or that he was delivered from that wrath to come. And that's what he tells the Thessalonians uh, that the Lord hath delivered us from the wrath to come. Amen. That that we, you see, uh, always remember the Lord hadn't only saved us to something, but he has saved us from something. Amen. He has saved us to heaven and mortal glory and he has saved us from an everlasting woe and misery. And oh, how we praise the Lord for that. Go back to verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 4. For all things are for your sakes. He's telling the Corinthians, all, all, of the, all that I face, this dying in my own body. In other words, uh, uh, I, I'm at the, at the state of death. It, it could happen the next second at any time. And, and, and we see that, the things that, that Paul went through with. And, and he says that also, uh, that he, uh, in another place, that he suffers uh, all things uh, for the elect's sake. He endured all things for the elect's sake. That, that why? For the elect of God, that they could also obtain the salvation uh, that is in Christ Jesus, uh, also with eternal glory. I didn't get every word just right there. But in other words, it's, it's letting us know, amen, that there's a timely deliverance as well as uh, that hereafter deliverance. And Paul wasn't going about enduring all things for their hereafter deliverance. But he was enduring the all things uh, here in this life to get to them to preach the gospel that they could have gospel deliverances. Yeah. And, and, and how do you have gospel deliverances? By obeying the gospel. Amen. Obeying and do what it says. And it's a deliverance unto you. The saved, uh, the gospel saves the saved. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Verse 16 in 2 Corinthians 4. For which cause we faint not. For which cause, what, what he's just talked about up above here. I don't faint. I don't languish. I don't despair. In other words, I'm not coming to that, to that point. He doesn't say it here, but in other words, compared Jeremiah got to. It, it may have even been that the apostle, we don't read it. We don't hear the, the apostle record it. The words that like his Job wrote down and like his Jeremiah wrote down about cursed be the night wherein a man child was conceived and the day that I was born. We don't particularly read that kind of language. But that doesn't mean that Paul did not come to low points along that same line from time to time, but he didn't faint. For which cause we faint not. For the cause of the gospel I don't faint. I press on. But though our outward man perish, yes, this outward man is perishing. We are a tri-being Body, soul, and spirit. God made Adam from the dust of the ground that God had created. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. God made that body. Then God breathed in it that spirit of life 
and also gave Adam a soul. God is a tri-being, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In God's likeness and image, we are created tri. And Adam was created a tri-being. God made his body from the dust of the earth, breathed into him the Spirit, and, and gave unto him. And I believe that in, in procreation, uh, that uh, not only is a, a body conceived, but also the, the Spirit and the soul is given at that point. In the very point of life, in the very point of conception, God gives a soul. Now, I don't believe God's got them stacked up like cord, like a cordwood, uh, racks of wood in heaven or in a vault somewhere. Amen. But, but God creates, creates and gives ever how he does. We don't have scriptural language, and I don't want to be presumptuous, and I don't want to speak where the scriptures don't speak. Amen. But I fully believe that in the giving of uh, life, of a body in, in conception, that there's also uh, the spirit and the soul that is given at that time. Yeah. Just as God did that for Adam. Now, it's a hard thing for me, and it's always been, and it's a great mystery, and I cannot separate. Sometimes in the Bible, when it talks about spirit, I can't separate it from soul, and I can't separate soul from spirit. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it's a great mystery to me. But it's not to the Lord. Because this living Word is a discerner and a divider even of the soul and spirit. The Bible teaches us, and I'm talking about the living Word. I'm talking about the Word that was made flesh. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Amen. That Word, that living Word, he can separate between soul and spirit. Yeah. And I tell you the, 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 that uh, the scripture speaks of body, soul, and spirit. Yeah. Amen. The, the, the Bible teaches us to serve and to praise God with our body, our soul, and our spirit. All right? Right there is the three that is mentioned. So uh, we understand the conclusion of the whole matter there at the end of Ecclesiastes. He talked about there could be many books written and, uh, and, and with much uh, studying of it and so forth, uh, of the, the, the weariness of it, that's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there's no end. And much study, study is a weariness of the flesh. Then, then he says, after he says that, in other words, it, it's, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. Yeah. But then he says, here it is in a nutshell. Yeah. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And that's not in the hereafter, that's now. That's right here and now. So, the apostle, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You have an inward man. You have a new man. You have a new creation in you in Christ Jesus. And this is what is renewed. This is the strength that is renewed. You know, I've had some old saints of God to tell me, you know, when they're up uh, 80 and 90 years old, they said, but inside I feel like a teenager. I've had them tell me that. But inside I feel like a teenager. What was it? The outside was perishing. The outside was stooped. The outside, the hands uh, uh, were dragging. The, the knees were feeble. The teeth were gone. The eyes were blind. The ears uh, didn't have the hearing like it once had had. But yet they tell me inside they feel like a teenager. I can only be God. 
That can only be the working of God. That can only be the Lord. Amen. Uh, given the strength from the inward man uh, that affects their soul, that's affecting their soul and their spirit that is, that is intertwined, that is entangled, tied up, tangled up, all wrapped up in Jesus. Uh, amen. That's how he is in you. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is within you in a cleaned out place in your very soul that's been sanctified, set apart in the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And in there dwells uh, cleanliness and godliness. Uh, uh, there abides the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in that place. Uh, and it's in that uh, that you feel renewed and feel strengthened and feel the desire to press on in the way of the Lord. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Thank God for that. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Our life here is just a fleeting moment. We read about some of it there in Psalm 103. It's this grass. The wind passeth over it. It's gone. And, uh, and no one knows about it, the place where it had been. Oh, there's, there's been a many of folks uh, that the earth, uh, they were buried hundreds of years ago and uh, there, there's, there's no sign of them now. There's the, the, the graves. You, you know, there's so many people buried in different places. You go back centuries and centuries and centuries. Uh, uh, it's, all, what we think about today where folks are buried, we think about these well-kept gardens and memory gardens and, and, and churchyard gardens and but how many has the woods and uh, how many has uh, uh, the, the underbrush and all of that taken over uh, and, and gone back in, into a natural state and the graves aren't even seen. Well, that body, it would be just a fine line. Now, since I've said that, let me say this. Many, many years ago, uh, Nancy's Creek Church they have a cemetery across the road over there across from the building there in Shamley and marred a bus or train they wanted to put an extension or new line through there and so there was graves there's even uh, revolutionary war soldiers buried out there that's how far it goes back and probably even further that church was constituted in eight, that itself was constituted in 1824. But nevertheless, they had to assume the bodies and, and move them. Well, that was a tedious task because it was reported and one eyewitness that was there and oversaw and was looking at some of that assuming and so forth. You go back 200, 250 years, folks put in wooden boxes. They're gone. Them wooden boxes are gone. That body's decayed. But they said after so far down, said there would just be a, a discoloration there in that grave. And it'd be a line about the length of a body if it's an adult body. It's just like a line of discoloration there in the soil. And that's, that's what there was there to assume. There was nothing but just that little bit of dust, that line. So, there, after your children and their children, and maybe even their children are gone, there, there, nobody remember you. Nobody remember me. Our life is fleeting. But thank God there's one that will remember us. And that's the most important. Yeah. That's our Heavenly Father. That's our Heavenly Father that will remember us. Our light affliction here, our fleeting life, our short life, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now that on the surface can be hard to understand there because it 
your mind could lead you in the wrong direction in rightly dividing that. I want to submit unto you that these afflictions that it's speaking of here, when it says for our light affliction, our light trials, troubles, tribulations, we have those things because we're dual nature. We have a damning nature, but we're born in the Spirit of God. We're created in Christ Jesus after true, true holiness. There's a new creation for, as, as Ephesians 2 and, 11 say, and 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're his workmanship. We're his creation in the new birth. There's a creation. All right, and then therefore there, there is a warfare. Do you know that your afflictions, your trials, your troubles after the gospel, after uh, the, the life of being a disciple, you always remember this too, that it's far easier for trash. Well, it's not only far easier, that's the way it's going to go. A stream, all it's going to do is float downstream. That's all trash is going to do is float downstream. Well, I want to tell you, when you're trying to go in a way of discipleship, you're, you're treading water. You're treading against the current. You're, you're, you're treading upstream. You're going against the current. You're going against the flow of this world, the old, the old man, the flesh, the world, the devil, and so forth. But your trials and troubles and tribulations in, in trying to follow the Lord and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, many of those you would not have if you were not endeavoring to follow the Lord. Right? You wouldn't have those. So this is, this is the, the affliction and, and it's the evidence that you are one of the Lord's. And uh, this is in the context that it's saying that it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Because these light, that weight of glory, that that you're going to experience in heaven in immortal glory, that hope, that earnest expectation that you have, fall, will far exceed the afflictions the, he calls them light affliction that you have here in trying to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I said before, if we can have an earnest expectation, if we can have a hope of, uh, that, that, that we're going to come through these things, if we realize this hope as Paul did, and uh, Paul uh, believed that his life was not in vain, his preaching was not in vain, that there would be a resurrection, uh, that these things that he endured for the elect's sake, uh, all that this jeopardy and this, this peril that he was uh, in, and he, he had the sentence of death in his own body. Yeah. But yet he could press on because, well, for one thing, I believe he was that man when he talked about 14 years earlier, yeah. whether in the body or in the spirit, he didn't know, but he went into the third heaven and saw things that was not lawful to speak of. Right. Oh, I tell you, brothers and sisters, Paul's great expectation of living with God in glory is what got him through here in this life. And our great expectation of living with God in glory will help get us through the light affliction and showing the evidence of a far weightier and great experience that is waiting in heaven and immortal glory. Yeah. Listen to verse 18 there in 2 Corinthians 4. While we look not at the things which are seen. Don't have your eyes upon these light afflictions. Now, I know in the, in, the, in the time of them, when you're in them, they're hard. Right. These light afflictions are hard. Everything is relevant, you know. And it's just like it was hard for Job that he cursed the day he was born, cursed the night he was conceived. Jeremiah cursed the day he was born, cursed the night he was conceived, even going to give up the ministry. So we're not saying that 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 it's it's not to the it's not uh, hard and burdensome and toilsome and, and discouraging. 
Oh, but we don't look at the things which are seen. But at the things which are not seen. You see, these things that you see, these tangible things, all of this, all of this is going to be done away with. This is now. It's here and now. The spiritual. That which God in the spirit world. That upper and better world. Jesus spoke of the world to come. He's speaking of heaven and immortal glory. That's that which is not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. They have no beginning in the mind and purpose of God, for God has no beginning. And they have no ending. They'll never end. But these temporal things will end. But this eternal, this spiritual, will not end. So therefore we have to keep our eyes upon that. There are many more things that could be said along these lines this morning, but I, I sure hope that this message has been an encouragement, that it's been an uplifting unto you, that it would help renew your strength and help you to keep pressing on, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If he's the author, the begetter of it, and he's the finisher of it, he's going to be there at the conclusion of it if he's going to finish it right. (laughs) And in order for him to be the author and the finisher, he's got to be there all in between. (laughs) He's there all in between, keeping that. And that's what Paul said to Philippians, that he was persuaded and believed. And so, being confident of this one thing, he that hath begun this good work in you will perform it. That means he will complete it. He will bring it to its completed finish in glorification of the body for your soul and spirit to live in that God had regenerated in the new birth. I told you there was more to say. God bless you. Let's stand together.